This is the Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy Podcast, episode number 20, Wetlands. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Our panelists today include Jill Costell. She's the Senior Environmental Engineer at the Wetlands Initiative, and Kurt Hansen. He is an Environmental Resource Specialist at Christopher B. Burke Engineering. Both are out of Chicago. Thanks for being with us. Jill, let's start with you. Can you tell me just a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'm the Senior Environmental Engineer at the Wetlands Initiative. Been there for about 15 years working on wetland design and now working with farmers on constructed wetlands. And Kurt? Um, So I'm an Environmental Resource Specialist or a Field Scientist with Christopher Burke Engineering. We're based out of Chicago, as you said, but we work all throughout the Midwest, uh, working both with uh, everything from really urban areas to really rural, rural areas. And uh, I do wetland delineations, tree plant and animal surveys, and everything in between. What does your day look like? Actually, both of you, I want to know what you do for a living day in and day out. What, what happens in your life? Well, usually we're looking at sites. It could be for constructed wetland or a restored wetland, but doing a lot of uh, off-site and on-site assessments. So we walk the land, similar to what Kirk does here. But we usually start with an off-site assessment, looking at using GIS data, aerial photographs, satellite imagery, trying to assess where is the best place to put a wetland and what are the kind of the hydrology and looking at things like that. So unfortunately, unlike Kurt, I spend a lot more time in the office than I care to, but then we have the opportunity to go out and do the on-site assessments. And I'm the lucky one because one of our clients is the Wetlands Initiative and we get to go out and I wake up every morning and I check the rain gauges from Springfield all the way up to the tippy top of Illinois right before we hit Wisconsin and I decide where I have to go to the day based on how much rain came down and then what our clients want us to go check out. So I hop in my truck, put on my pair of muck boots and get to work. So wait, you're checking gauges for what? Uh, Rainfall. So So a lot checking the height? A lot of where our job kicks in is we're dealing with... uh, what happens after it rains, whether it's we're dealing with uh, where a farmer might be worried about runoff from their farm and what's actually in that water, to if you're dealing with construction, uh, if you have a, what's called a NPDES permit and you have any sediment leaving your site, we have to go and track that too. Can you tell me what a smart wetland is? Yeah, that's just a program within the Wetlands Initiative. The Wetlands Initiative restores the wetlands of the Midwest for its benefits, water quality improvement, increased wildlife habitat and biodiversity and uh, increased flood storage. But within that, we have the Smart Wetlands Program, and that is specifically geared towards agriculture and working with farmers for these small, precisely designed, constructed wetlands. So we kind of play a play on the typical acronym of SMART, specific, measurable, aligned, relevant, except we don't do time-bound. We're timeless, in a way, in terms of how a wetland works. But also because of the technology that we're using not only to help us design the wetlands, but also how we're monitoring these wetlands for their water quality improvement. Do they work very well for nutrient loss reduction? Yes, they're one of the best and most cost-effective and efficient practices out there for tile drainage. How does that happen? So part of what you're seeing is if you're looking at like a bioreactor, a lot of times you're bringing in something to try to trap all those nutrients and keep them from going somewhere else. You have to go in, maintain it, keep on replacing that material. If we're putting in a wetland, we're actually using the plants that are growing in that wetland to help store that material and lock it all up so it's not leaving your site. Have you done work on sizing wetlands and what that means? Yeah, just for the constructed wetland, when we're talking about tile drainage treatment, we don't necessarily want the surface water, but when we size it, we use kind of the rule of thumb that you want to be 1% of your drainage area. And so that's a good indicator of hydraulic resident time or how long the water will be residing in that wetland to allow this natural processing to occur, which is really microbial driven. We want those denitrifying bacteria to take the nitrate and convert it into nitrate and gas. And those microbes are already in there. We're just trying to work with them and optimize that processing. Are you able to dump tiled land right into a wetland? Yep. Yes, we can. So the idea is we're routing the tile to the wetland. The water will just flow through that wetland and then outlet back to where it was originally. On that note, producers are going to want to know, is this thing going to back up my tiles? And is it going to keep my farm field wet? And is there a way to avoid that? Well, that's why we work with these professional engineers at Christopher Burke Engineering, because we do a lot of modeling to ensure that, because we do not want that to happen. This is supposed to be an improvement to the land, an asset to their land, and we just want to make sure that we do not impact farming. Yes. So how do you do that? Do you do that with uh, 
mechanically by putting a weir in the wetland or what happens? So how we control the water level in the wetland is through a water control structure, your typical water control structure. But one of the design criteria is what we call our normal water level in the wetland. That has to be below the flow line of the tile. We do not want that water being over the tile. It has to be under. So these are really shallow wetlands. You can think of it as a shallow pond, but we're only having 12 to 18 inches of water in there. And that's kind of the perfect conditions to remove nitrate. Where does a wetland work? What conditions should a farmer look for on his fields that make it work? And the really big thing that she's brought up multiple times is we're really looking for where we already have a either existing or you're putting in a tile drainage system and you're attaching these to your tile drainage system. And then obviously then you want somewhere <laughs> at the end for then that water to be able to leave. And we kind of work with the farmers just to emphasize we don't want their most profitable ground. That's not, we were looking at those areas that are maybe low revenue, no revenue lands, not profitable, or hard to farm areas. You know, with today's equipment, it's hard to get in those tight corners sometimes or those weird little angles, and we can help kind of straighten out that area. So we can kind of, we custom design these with the landowner. Our job is to kind of make sure it hits the standards to ensure we have this nutrient uh, removal, but we work with them and every one of them is different. What kind of investment does it take? It is a capital, a capital expense to put in a wetland, but because it's a long life practice that it's a very cost effective practice. Uh, so thanks to Farm Bill financial assistance programs, that kind of helps uh, address some of that, that implementation costs. At the Wetlands Initiative, we provide free technical assistance with the design. We work with our partners at NRCS and Soil and Water Conservation Districts with this. And then if they're interested in Conservation Reserve Program or the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, we will help them through that process and that will help with the cost. And in that process, what you have to think about too, when you're investing in one of these smart wetlands, not only are you increasing the capital you have in your nutrient reduction system, but you're also getting some of these additional benefits that come in with the plants, animals, the beautification, and like we're talking about, your reduction of any of that nutrient that would be leaving your site, all kind of bundled into one. So I have two questions following up in that. First, is it permanent? It does not have to be permanent, no. And the additional benefits, what kind of really nail that down for me? What, what kinds of things? So some of the benefits that I can speak to personally and that I deal with every day is you're going to deal with, you're going to have a lot more of the pollinator plants uh, pollinator species hanging out. So if you have children, grandchildren, family members that like spending time in nature, that's something that you're now adding to uh, this portion of your property. It's doing something physically capital-wise for your farm while also being something that is aesthetically pleasing. On top of that, you're getting uh, more of those pollinators to come through. If you like watching birds, you're going to have a lot more birds that are passing through your site. Um, we're talking about you could have uh, deer that are hanging out in this area, pheasants, um, hunting can get involved in that as well. Wait, you, you mean I can choose the kinds of plants that I want in my wetland? Yes, you can. And the nice thing about wetlands too is as you get closer and further away from this wetland, you're dealing with different amounts of water that are in your soil and uh, you get into a very broad diversity of plants. And a lot of our, if you do it through a, a federal assistance program, one of the nice thing is, is there's a buffer around it. And every one of our farmers so far have e, uh, elected to do pollinator habitat. But they can do grasses, they can do other things to, to kind of protect that wetland um, from the farm ground. But these are artificial systems, so they're not regulated. So they're not like a typical, say, restored or enhanced wetland. So that's why we say they're not permanent because after 15 years of the, the program, if you want to, you can fill it back in. Tell me more about the cost share and what's available. So through the Conservation Reserve Program, you get your soil rental rate as well as assistance in terms of the implementation cost, the construction cost, the seeding cost, the planting cost. And through similar through the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, you'll get uh, financial assistance or rate payment for the various practices associated with implementing a constructed wetland. What's the construction process like? I'll let you start off with that one, then I'll <laughs> add some tidbits in. Yes, we've been out on the side for quite a few. So essentially we're building a shallow pond. So it is excavation. So that's the predominant cost is about 95% is moving the earth. 
uh, building this shallow pond system, one of the key aspects of a constructed wetland is that we want this clay liner. We want to make sure we're keeping the water in the wetland. And luckily, we have nice clay out there in a lot of our regions. And so we're able to use that. And then we, the topsoil that we have scraped off, and kind of stockpile that to the side. We dig out the material we don't want, pile that, and then we pull that topsoil back in, and that serves as our growth media for this wetland vegetation. And that's where I wanted to kick back in after you uh, mentioned the actual phasing and that it really does come down to timing, too, if you're talking about how quickly it takes to get these things online. Um, if it's just like with any other aspect of farming, if you hit a wet spell, if you hit a dry spell, if that can all affect your timeline here. So if you look at the last couple of weeks that we've had, uh, we've had a good amount of rain every couple of days and then days of dry and lots of sun. It's a great time right now <laughs> to put one together. We're at the end of the dry season. You're still getting plenty of sunshine. We're in still good end of the growing season. It's a good year, time of year to get one of these built and finished up. So, so a couple of points of clarification. You prefer this on tiled land because we're doing a constructed wetland. The tiles dump into the wetland, but it's not really a filtration system in the way that we think of filtering through the soil and the rocks. It is the plant that is doing and the, the microbes. filtering. And the microbes that are doing the filtering. Yeah, it's a very key, it's a kind of a combination. The microbes are breathing in that nitrate. These denitrifying bacteria that are already in there are breathing in that nitrate, but they need an energy source, and that's carbon. So in a denitrifying bi bioreactor, we think of wood chips as our carbon source. So in a wetland, it's the plants are providing the carbon. And so they're providing the environment for these bacteria to flourish and be successful in transforming. So essentially they're using this as fuel. Yes. And they expend the fuel in the process of creating the plant. Right. And the plants temporarily take up the nutrients as well. But unfortunately, the plants do die off into the fall. And they are actually putting that carbon layer down for the microbes for the next year as well. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. That's Kurt Hansen. He is an environmental resource specialist at Christopher B. Burke Engineering out of Chicago, Illinois, and Jill Castell. She's the senior environmental engineer at the Wetlands Initiative, also in Chicago. I'm U of I Extensions, Todd Gleason. <laughs>